It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I am your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Now, you can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting if you email me at oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. Uh, if you like our show and all of our content, be sure and check out our Patreon, the Opperman Report Patreon. Uh, I got all the PDD stuff up there, the indictments. I got a video of Jonathan Odie, who shot up, uh, being interrogated by U.S. Secret Service in 2018. And he's talking about all this Diddy stuff. He sued Diddy himself. And his case is still open. That's a fascinating video. I got the Franklin cover-up, 700 pages there. Uh, all the recent indictments. Uh, I, I, I put up all that kind of content right away. So I got a hold of that thing, that Iranian dossier on J.D. Vance. I have that up there, too, on the Opperman Report Patreon. But if you go to our Spreaker, Spreaker.com, and you Google Janet Phelan, P-H-E-L-A-N. She's been on several times before. Fascinating woman. Always up to something. Uh, she's been an expert on many, many topics over the years, especially that whole Lyme disease. We never really talked about that with her. Uh, we have to do that one day. But the, if you want to check out her books, At the Breaking Point of History, How Decades of U.S. Duplicity Enabled the Pandemic, and another one called Exile, which we're going to be talking about today. Not the book, but what she's going through over there, because she is an exile. And you can find that at bookpatch.com. Otherwise, you can find all of her writings or articles at the Activist Post. Uh, Janet Phelan, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you very much for having me on, Ed. Hey, it's always great to have you back. It's always great to have you. Um, remind the audience, though, if, if they don't remember, who is Janet Phelan? Well, I'm, I'm a journalist. Um, I've been a journalist for decades. Um, I did my graduate work at the University of Missouri at Columbia in uh, journalism back, back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. And um, I uh, uh, was forced to flee the U.S. in uh, 2008. And... Um, I have now filed a lawsuit that is subsequent, you know, that is directly connected to the reasons for fleeing. And uh, I'm hoping that we can talk about the lawsuit today because it's taking some very weird twists and turns as it makes its way through the federal court system. Yeah, 100%. I understand you're suing the CIA, uh, which has to be an uphill uh, fight. I, I guess we should start with uh, what caused you to, to take off to Mexico back in 2008? Is that a good place to start? Um, yeah. I, um, <clears throat> as, uh, as uh, basically the narrative of, of why I left is told in my book, Exile, um, which is available at thebookpatch.com. And essentially... Um, I became a, a person of interest and had some absolutely horrible things happening to me, and um, including uh, uh, unwanted police att attention that had graduated to an assault on my person by officers of the law in Long Beach, California, which rendered me unconscious and into a hospital. So this wasn't any sort of airy-fairy kind of perception of threats. There were concrete actions taken against me, which were actually uh, terrifying. And I decided in 2008, I <clears throat> was living in Southern Oregon. I was working as a reporter at the American's Bulletin and hosting two radio shows every week, one on KSKQ, which is the local Pacifica affiliate and also one on Republic Broadcasting Network. And the police, the, the, the misconduct began to be alarming again. Um, and I chose to, to uh, throw in my cards and leave. So, um, so that's, that's the story in a nutshell. Well, just to get this straight, you, you, your first problem with the police were in Long Beach, California, but then later on they continued in a whole other state in Oregon. Right. Right, different, um, different police departments, of course. The, the, the attention I've gotten and the reasons for the person of interest 
issue appear to be federal. So it, it's certainly not a local issue, which of course um, has graduated to my now suing, the, well, suing. Uh, I'm requesting a, an injunction. I'm requesting no money whatsoever. I'm simply saying stop this. And stop what? Um, the, the, the lawsuit, the request for the injunction, essentially uh, connotes three causes of action, stating that three separate uh, things are, are occurring to me that are illegal, immoral, and life-threatening, and that, uh, you know, I'm requesting an injunction, which is stating that the court needs to instruct the CIA to stop. The reason that I am naming the CIA is that at this point in time, having fled the country, I'm in southern Mexico, mm -hmm. and the Central Intelligence Agency is ostensibly the only uh, federal intelligence agency that has the mandate to operate abroad. Yeah, so, legally, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, let me ask you this: so, back it up just a little bit. What was it that uh, back in Long Beach and in Oregon that that caused? The, what, what were you up to back then that brought so much uh, negative attention upon yourself? Right. Um, the situation doesn't. It, it surrounds the, the the murder of my mother and the subsequent cover up, and that is the the meat and potatoes of exile. What happened to my mother? Uh, there are various. I'm big on documentation, Ed, and there is therefore an appendix of 50-plus uh, pages in the back of the book uh, containing external documentation. So if someone says, well, that couldn't happen, well, look at the records. You know, the, these, are, these are external records, meaning they're court records, police records, medical records, et cetera. And uh, so we... Um, as I was attempting to protect her, I became increasingly aware that uh, the parties involved in hurting her, and she was actually, quote-unquote, legally kidnapped and disappeared. Um, there was an attempt on her life, uh, and, and then she ended up dead. So um, it became very clear to me that the parties involved in hurting her were uh, were not local parties. Mm. So as as it became clearer and clearer to me, uh, whom who were the perpetrators here, who it was, I had engaged. My own situation became more and more perilous. So. And what would be the motivation going after your mother? Is she like an activist? Like you're like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Is she like, like Janet Phelan out there, like a muckraker no. uh, causing trouble? No, she wasn't. Um, she was a retired clinical psychologist. Mm. Um, my father was a, was a muckraker. My father was a journalist. He had written for the Saturday Evening Post until the post closed in 69. And at that point, he decided he wasn't going to work for anybody anymore. He was going to basically work freelance. And his articles ended up in uh, Playboy, Esquire, Fortune, Forbes. He was essentially A-list. His first book came out in 76 and made the cover of Time magazine. So um, I think Dad really stepped into it in his reporting on on the Kennedy assassination vis-a-vis uh -huh. uh, vis -vis the, the effort by uh, DA Jim Garrison to bring to trial for the assassination of, of JFK, uh, an individual named Clay Shaw. And my father's reporting on this actually uh, resulted in history being impacted. Um, he did a cover story for the Saturday Evening Post on this and uh, ended up with a bullseye on his back. And, so, and you think that was the cause of your mother's murder? Um, I, I think that the attention my yeah. father got uh, resulted in, in attention to the family 
Um, but I don't believe that that's why my mother was murdered. Uh, just briefly, when I talk about attention, um, my father uh, at one point did a FOIA for his FBI file, and when he received it, um, he realized that even though a lot of it was redacted, there was some information in there, and he knew what phone call he made to whom in which he parlayed this information. We were already concerned that the phone was tapped. Uh, you know, back when I was growing up, uh, the, the technology was not as seamless as it is now, and there was all this whirring and spitting on the line. And as a child, I thought this was funny, you know. And uh, I, I started taunting J. Edgar Hoover on the phone, like, Hey, J. J. Edgar, you listening to our phone calls now? I hope it's fun for you. Hey, J. Edgar, still wearing that dress? You know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. And uh, unfortunately, it wasn't funny at all. And uh, so having received his FBI file, my father decided to go to the corner to the payphone to make his sensitive journalistic calls. So what, what I'm saying is that the family got on the radar that way. But the reasons for the murder of my mother, Emily Phelan, and the, the subsequent cover-up, which was profound, uh, I believe go to a far darker agenda, which we now see playing out on the world stage. Um, just to clarify, uh, my mother was Jewish. Um, my father was not. He was uh, uh, he had been brought up in a Catholic family and left the church as fast as his little legs would take him. But uh, my mother was Jewish. And uh, after surviving what had happened to her, I became very concerned that there was and is a, a profound uh, anti-Jewish sentiment in in certain sectors of the U.S. government, and I believe, and actually predicted in, in exile this war in Israel, mm -hmm. which I don't believe is going to go very well for Israel. I believe Israel is going to be wiped off the map. Um, and I have particular reasons for, for thinking that. Uh, and, uh, and, so having taken care of the 9 million or so, you know, people who live in Israel, there, there then has to be dealt with uh, those of us in the diaspora. And uh, frankly, given the existence of this uh, covert uh, delivery system that I document completely uh, in, uh, at the breaking point of history, I believe that uh, this particular delivery system could well be used to uh, attack those in the diaspora under a complete covert, uh, covert means and plausible deniability. Now, all of this sounds very conspiratorial. Unfortunately, you know, the, 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 the events on the world stage seem to be bearing out my concerns. So... That's what I think produced my mother's murder and this ridiculous vendetta that I'm now, you know, experiencing and, and have brought to court under, uh, you know, these three causes of action. Okay, you've mentioned a couple of times a covert delivery system. Explain what you're talking about there. Right. Um, well, uh you know, the U.S. I even had to look military. up diaspora. Okay? <laughs> I looked up diaspora to find out what that meant. But I understand what that means. This people dispersed around the, around the world. But uh, a covert delivery system, explain that to me. Right. Um, so uh, there exists, well, we know that the U.S. military has produced some daunting weapon systems. And uh, these are, you know, usually trotted out for some degree of public inspection, but one of the things that is not clarified or made clear to the public at all is that there exists a weapon system that is aimed at U.S. residents. 
Now, um, this involves the the tweaking of uh, of city water systems to provide a a, a a delivery system for biological or chemical warfare. And uh, those who who are scratching their heads and saying, "Well, this is fantastic," um, I really encourage you. You don't have to buy the book. Uh, the, this system is well documented in the 2021 book at the breaking point of history with uh, blueprints, uh, letters back and forth between government agencies and more. Uh, but you don't have to buy the book. You can you, all the information about this delivery system uh, is online and mostly available at activist posts. Well, can you so, give us a, yeah. like an abbreviated version of what is in the water and then how would they activate it? And how would they uh, weaponize it? Right. Um, so what I have documented is not so much the contents of water, but the, 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 the fact that water systems have been reconfigured to function as a delivery system. And they have done this in a, a, a actually rather diabolically simple way. Uh, there now are two main lines uh, running down the street in, uh, well, every city that I've checked in, in the U.S. Uh, two main lines for water. Uh, one carries obviously water, and the other will call it, uh, you know, line X. And line X is connected to the main line uh, via uh, service lines that cross connect with the main line and go into every single house. Now, uh, that's sort of concerning. Uh, why? would this system exist like this? And one can see from the, uh, the documents that I, I culled before being forced to flee the country uh, that uh, the, the government isn't uh, revealing this second line. Uh, if you make a Public Records Act request, for example, to a city water system, You'll, for blueprints, you'll get blueprints showing one line. But uh, in fact, the real blueprints, which I was able to get through back doors, which I discuss, you know, what kind of back doors extensively in the book, uh, show two lines. So that second line is being covered up. Now, whatever is in the second line is being withheld by remote control valves. So, uh, if one wants to release whatever is in the second line, let's call it the vodka line, okay? Mm. Let's just say that they, they want to get people drunk, okay? So, so they've got a second line containing vodka, and it's being withheld by these remote control valves, which, by the way, I have uh, uh, the government on record as denying exists. Um, and also, of course, I got some pictures of the remote control Wait, valves. You have, you have photographs of these there. second lines? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, not, see, because I'm wondering, you know, I, I know a lot of guys in construction, you know, the home builders and even the developers and the plumbers, you know, and like so, like plumbers working on uh, people's regular plumbing lines, they would know about this second line. And, and my second question would be, then what about maintenance? Who is maintaining these second uh, set of lines? They must leak. They must need repairs and upkeep and all kind of maintenance and stuff, right? Well, um, yeah, I, I would imagine they do. Uh, but the, 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 they, at this point, they exist, and uh, you know the contents are being withheld by remote control valves, and the government is is denying this. And actually, I have I have one communication from the city of Los Angeles, in which they said uh, they wrote me, which is reproduced in the book, saying, um, "Yes, we understand that you want these blueprints and." Give us some time because we're going to have to redact information, meaning we'll have to create entirely new blueprints for you. And lo and behold, the blueprints they produced were at odds with the blueprints I'd already gotten through the back door, 
which show clearly the two lines. The, 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 the response to the Public Records Act request is to give me one line with no, with no remote control valve. So why the cover-up? Now, it's my understanding uh, from various sources. Um, I, I could name them here. I'm not sure if they'd be happy about that. Uh, but it's my understanding that this system was deployed during the pandemic in New York City and uh, resulting in, in more deaths than, than would have uh, been naturally ascribed to the pandemic. So we have a system, you know, that it can be used under plausible deniability to specifically target households. And you have all this documented in the book Exile, which is available at no, Book no, Petra. No, 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 no. This is all documented in the breaking point of at the breaking point. Oh, of history. gotcha. Sorry about that. Okay, um, right. That's the other book that's available actually on Amazon at the breaking point of history: How Decades of U.S. Duplicity Enabled the Pandemic. Pandemic. Janet Phelan. Uh, and that's all you can find that on uh, Amazon. Five star reviews. I'm looking over here. Thirty one ratings. Must have sold a lot of books. Uh, get that many ratings. So, so, so the fact is, this weapon system exists. Now, the question is, of course, what is it going to be used for? Who is it going to be used against? And you know, this, this, in my thinking, Ed, there, there's no acceptable answer to that. Uh, you, you, you can't attack. Uh, U.S. residents slash citizens uh, under uh, plausible deniability under, you know, no matter who they are. I mean, you simply can't do this. It's, it's unconstitutional. It's, it's, against, it's against everything that our country uh, ostensibly stands for. And so... Oh, you know, you know, I'm going to kind of throw you a little curveball here, right? Uh, but when you're talking about this, the first thing it makes me think of is Flint, Michigan, where we know oh, yeah. there's poison coming through the lead pipes there, you know, and it's, it's we've known this for a long, long time at this point, you know, and they're not making any effort to repair this. Uh, no, filters and stupidity and nonsense. And then the woman who discovered all this dies mysteriously. Have you factored that? Uh, have you looked into that as, as to in, in conjunction with what you're discovering here? Um, yes, and that there's actually a chapter in, in at the breaking point of history about Flint. Actually, Flint is not the only town uh, that ended up, you know, with these lead pipes, which cause grave illness and disability. And there are other towns uh, in Michigan which have been found to contain the same uh, sort of, uh, you know, unfortunate pipes um and to my knowledge uh nothing is being done okay so i guess the next step is because we are starting to run out of time uh is you file this lawsuit against the cia an injunction to prevent them from uh actively harassing you um yes what i'm alleging essentially is called transnational repression. And um, transnational repression is something that the U.S. has made a big deal about in terms of foreign rogue states mm. harassing uh, their people who are now living within the U.S. And uh, a sociologist named Dana Moss has proposed a typology for transnational repression including lethal retribution, threats, surveillance, exile, um, all of which I've experienced. And um, uh, unfortunately, the U.S. does not seem to want to cop to the fact that they're now engaged in this abroad, uh, even though, interestingly enough, uh, China has accused the U.S. and the U.K. of transnational repression in the case of Julian Assange. Mm. So, it, you know, my, my stating that this is happening is not uh, particularly 
uh, unique. No, no, no. Uh, we, we see this. We see this firsthand. It just happened with Turkey, where they, they in, in D.C., where the Turkish goons uh, attacked a bunch of uh, uh, dissidents. Uh, we saw it too with Iran, where, where the Shah of Iran would, uh, when they would have those big protests in New York City. I saw this with my own eyes. They would go there and pull masks off people and take pictures of their faces. You know, I, firsthand I saw this. So we know that this, this happens. And to think that the right. United States is not doing with the most aggressive country on the planet. That oh, we're no, not no, doing. not the United States. <laughs> no, no, no. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Actually, interesting enough, Ed, the, the yeah. FBI has set up a tip line for transnational repression. Oh, really? So I thought, well, what the heck? I'll, I'll go ahead and call them and say, I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm living in Mexico and I'm experiencing transnational re- repression. Well, the FBI agents who answered the phone, uh, I called them twice, and then I just decided this wasn't going to work very well. And uh, on both um, in, in both cases, uh, the FBI agents were very pleasant and uh, inquisitive until they started to get down to the bare bones about what was happening to me and why I was reporting this. And when I started mentioning these three causes of action, which are very well documented, in the lawsuit, they immediately uh, experienced some sort of a sphincter problem and had to get off the line immediately. <laughs> so that was the end of that. Now um, I'm, you know, I'm alleging uh, basically uh, I'm I'm not alleging in this lawsuit uh, things that are are uh, dilatory. I'm I'm alleging that I'm being attacked by unconventional weapons. Mm. I provide uh, medical records to prove that the, the kinds of diagnoses I've now got, which are, are very scary diagnoses, uh, are, are actually the effects of these weapons. And I have a statement from a, a doctor, a naturopath, stating, well, you know, of course, renal failure can be caused by, you know, an attack with a chemical weapon. Of course it can. So, um, and that's one of the diagnoses. Uh, so I, I'm also alleging that I am being denied medical care. And while I have all of these medical records, which largely come from a hospitalization I, I that was incurred last year in Mexico City, I also have proof that the hospital and the doctors provided no treatment. So so I have these very scary diagnoses which mandate a certain uh, you know, form of treatment and I'm getting no treatment at all. So do, do the doctors give you an that, alternative theory of what caused the renal failure? Uh, no, no, they don't. Uh, they, 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 they simply documented the renal failure which they, uh, the medical records show stage five, which is, oh you know, God, so yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the stage before death. Actually, that, that record was produced a year ago. And my understanding of stage five renal failure is that you have a few days to live. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm a medical miracle. I'm doing, you know, obviously uh, things with diet and herbs in order to try to protect you know, what health I have left. Okay, somebody presents with fifth stage renal failure. The first thing you do is you get them on dialysis and then you get them on a kidney transplant list. I was denied all treatment. I was discharged from the hospital without treatment. So um, that is one level of concern. Um, So no, I didn't get on a kidney transplant list and I didn't get dialysis. Yeah, my brother so, was able to um, get a kidney transplant uh, yeah. and also a liver transplant, and uh, even uh, then he had a stent in his uh, <laughs> fixed, and even a hernia opera. The guy's like the six million dollar man. They replaced half of his his body. That was like thirty years ago, man, and he's walking around fine, you know. So uh, let's pray you can get into some kind of uh, uh, treatment over there. So, but but the Mexican government is denying you any kind of medical treatment. Well, I'm not saying it's the Mexican government. I'm saying that that there is a dark presence in my life yeah. that is uh, instructing people as to how to behave. And this is further buttressed upon leaving the hospital. 
um, due to the secondary diagnosis, which has involved uh, attacks on my legs, which has produced problems with walking. I actually fell and broke my hand, and I was forced to go back to another hospital to get this set. And there was no problem with with the first uh, first contact with the hospital. Uh, a cast was put on my arm, and I was told, come back in two weeks, and we'll just check the cast. I come back in two weeks, and the doctor insists on removing the cast. Uh, I have x-rays showing that the break hadn't healed. And he insisted on removing the cast and referring me to physical therapy, which would have essentially destroyed uh, any possibility of recuperation. Uh, lucky for me, I'm not stupid. I had the x-ray showing the break hadn't healed. I hightailed it to a pharmacy and bought a kind of brace mm. and put it on my, on my arm so that my arm would be immobilized even without the cast. So we have now multiple uh, records showing uh, heinous treatment uh, on on uh, from multiple different venues. And the third cause of action which is also extremely well documented in the lawsuit is denial of access to the legal system. And what do you know? The first thing that happened uh, when this was filed, and it was filed at the uh, Central District Court in California, was that it was immediately dismissed <laughs> by the mm. judge uh, w without without proper uh, uh reasoning. Uh, so, uh, you know, I immediately filed a notice of appeal. I'm now in the Ninth Circuit. So uh, the, the the initiating judge, who, whose name is John Holcomb, who dismissed the lawsuit, made some outrageous statements in the dismissal. Number one is uh, that the U.S. has sovereign immunity and the U.S. cannot be sued. Which means, of course, and this is very important, Ed, what it means is that the entire Bill of Rights is just toilet paper because we have no rights vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis our government if we have no legal re redress for when these rights are infringed upon. So that was one thing that, uh, that John Holcomb said uh, in his dismissal. He also cited a a case, I think it was U.S. versus Smith, which largely discusses whether or not uh, Antarctica is a foreign country, and he comes to the, the conclusion that because I'm outside of the U.S., I have no rights. Actually, there's a governing case, which is Reed versus Covert, which confirms that U.S. citizens residing outside of the country have all legal protections uh, granted by the Constitution, so he just he just went he went overboard in terms of attempting to dismiss the lawsuit and to dismiss it with prejudice, meaning it cannot be refiled. Yeah. Be refiled. So I have you know I immediately filed a notice, notice of appeal, and I'm now in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, there are some other cases that have been filed. Uh, you know, where there are allegations being made uh, of, of that, that individuals are, are now on a kill list. Um, one <clears throat> was around, I think, 2017 by a U.S.-born citizen who became a, also a journalist and was reporting for CNN and Al Jazeera and other venues in the Middle East he, uh, his birth name was Darren Phelps. He adopted the mus Muslim name of Bilal Abdul Karim, and he alleged that the U.S. put him on a kill list and tried to kill him in Syria. So, uh, you know, that's one case. His case was also dismissed. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, there are implications here because if, if U.S. journalists are being put on to kill lists and uh, being murdered abroad and there's no there, there, there's simply no venue for redress then what does that say about anybody else 
And for people who are thinking, oh, this is far-fetched, just look back at the COINTEL program, uh, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. How many of those people were murdered? Uh, cold blood. Uh, clarify some, a couple of things for me, though. Uh, you mentioned Antarctica. I heard, I heard you say Antarctica. Right? Well, how does that fit into all this? No. You didn't mention it. It, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, it doesn't. Holcomb, Holcomb threw in a red herring in attempting to dismiss my lawsuit, you know, stating that there was this case, uh, uh, U.S. versus Smith or Smith versus U.S. or something, in which, uh, you know, there, there's this extensive discussion of whether or not Antarctica is a foreign country or not. But it, it's irrelevant because the, the guiding principle is Reed versus Covert, which confirms that U.S. citizens residing abroad have full constitutional protection. And you're still a U.S. citizen? Yes, I am. You've kept your citizenship, okay. Absolutely. Now, that in itself has a lot of difficulties in, in uh, Mexico, right? Because you can't own property there and stuff like that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of problems with that, right? Uh, I rent. <laughs> there's not a problem. Okay. Now, it must have been difficult even uh, obtaining uh, legal representation to take on this case. Well, tell us what was that procedure like? You must have contacted 20 lawyers, right? Um, yes. And I, I, I'm very grateful that I got uh, profoundly good legal advice. Um, so, well, some of it was good. Some of it was not so good. Um, however, I am per se. I am not represented by counsel. I did get some behind the scenes um, advice, but no. Gotcha. I, yeah, no, no, I, I, I can see that happening. This, I can't imagine anybody want to take this case, to tell you the truth. You know, uh, and I could, from my own personal experience, I could tell you. <sighs> it's a... Well, I actually, uh, I contacted lawyers who took Bilal Abdul Karim's case and okay. bailed, you know, and uh, they considered it for about a heartbeat and said, no, we're not going to take this one. So, so yeah. be it. I got you. So now, now we are now at the, you're in the appeals court and you're, you're appealing this uh, judge's decision. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And I, and I got a communication from the ninth circuit saying, that uh, my, you know, my lawsuit was dismissed by John Holcomb with prejudice, and I needed to explain why I should be allowed to proceed. And, you know, I frankly decimated uh, John Holcomb's arguments in a legal brief, which I have also put online uh, uh, attached to uh, a press release in Activist Post I believe it's titled, Is This Federal Judge Trying to Suppress a Civil Rights Action or some such thing? So I, I put I put John Holcomb's response, his ridiculous, pathetic response, and uh, also, you know, my reply to it. So now I'm waiting for the Ninth Circuit to weigh in. Now, Janet Phelan, here's my concern as a practical matter. Let's say you get everything you want, and Judge Holcomb says, okay, Ms. Phelan, I apologize. You know, we're going to put, put a uh, restraining order against the CIA from bothering Janet Phelan. And the CIA receives this restraining order and it says, we, we promise <laughs> we're going to stop doing all this stuff. But of course, what, 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 would, what would prevent them from con- not, not missing a beat? You know, do you, do you really think that they would stop just for, for a court order? Um, well, see, that, that's a very good question, Ed, and yeah. that question has been proposed to me by one of the lawyers uh, helping me behind the scenes. Like, yeah. like you know, these people aren't going to stop, okay? So, um, however, if I did not make this public, if I did not file the request for the injunction, if I did not make all of this bad behavior public, then, you know, then what am I doing with my life? And what hope does anyone have yeah. for for any sort of redress to a similar situation? We have to take advantage of the available venues. And, you know, frankly, I have no idea what the CIA is going to do. Uh, uh, they haven't backed off. They have been sent a cease and desist letter. 
they, uh, you know, have been noticed that they've been sued and they're not backing off. So apparently, you know, Chevron decision notwithstanding, they, they believe themselves to be entitled to kill whomever they want. Right. And the Chevron decision was the recent Supreme Court ruling saying that these agencies cannot create policy, something along that lines, right? Correct. Yeah. The, the, right. Correct. Yeah. The, that, that, that many of the policies that they're creating are, you know, contrary to statutory and constitutional law, and they can't do that, right? So, so we've got we've got layers. I mean, we've got, you know, what appears to be legal decisions, which ostensibly should impact agency behavior, and then we have, on the other hand, the agency behavior, yeah. which is you know basically just flipping off uh, the Supreme Court. Well, let me ask you a question now. When you sent the, the C&D to the uh, CIA, um, the cease and desist letter to the CIA, did you get a response from them? No. Yeah. And but now when you file this uh, injunction, you, you, they, you got a legal response from them, right, and before Judge Holcomb? No. No, no response? No, 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 no. The, the, the response was that Holcomb immediately tried to dismiss the suit. Oh, that's interesting. So he's actually acting, one could say, as a proxy for the CIA. Uh, I'm trying to rack my brain here if I've ever heard of that happening before, where the, without the response that the judge takes it upon himself to dismiss, without yeah. being requested. Yeah. Well, uh, it, no, it, I, no, I, I, I can it think. It can happen. Yeah, it I, can happen. It did happen. And it did I'm happen. Thinking, yeah, I can recall an instance where it happened. I don't know where he's involved. Okay, very, very fascinating stuff. So where are we? What's the next step? What are you going to do uh, after this uh, appeal? Well, you know, I'm waiting patiently to see what the Ninth Circuit does. It's has It has had my answer for good grief, like uh, over a month. Mm. And uh, I'm waiting to, to see how it weighs in. If it weighs in in my favor... Then it's you know essentially attacked the the decision making power of another federal judge, John Holcomb. And uh, if it doesn't weigh in in my favor, then it has attacked the Constitution. So you know I I think they're kind of between a rock and a hard place. I, I don't want to make any predictions about what they do. I'm just simply waiting uh, to see how they will respond to this. But I have to, you know, emphasize that this case, like the book, like the Kareem case, has massive implications for all of us. This is not just Janet Phelan being uh, messed with in Mexico. This opens the door for any of us being messed with anywhere without proper redress. So... You mentioned earlier that, that, that you discovered a kill list. How, can, can you give us some details around that? Well, um, we know that... Okay, I haven't discovered a, key, uh, a kill list. Yeah. We know that uh, American citizens have been put on a kill list prior um, because it has received media attention. For example... Um, Alawaki, who was killed by a drone strike in the Middle East uh, some years ago, was put on a kill list by Obama, and it got a lot of attention. Uh, Alawaki was also a U.S. born. He was a citizen. So uh, this case uh, seems to have opened the door to other U.S. citizens being put onto onto kill lists. Um, how can this happen? I mean, isn't that... Does the Constitution guarantee due process? And, and I don't believe that the determination of a president that this person has to go uh, constitutes due process. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Alawaki's family did sue uh, the U.S. government over this. Uh, 
their case was dismissed by the same federal judge, Rosemary Collier, who dismissed the Kareem case. Mm. So, you know, uh, these these cases get some attention, and then they they, they kind of die off. Uh, but the implications of these cases are profoundly disturbing. Janet Phelan, uh, you can find Janet Phelan's book, Exile, at bookpatch.com, and you can find her writing at the Activist Post. Uh, we only have about nine minutes left, and in our, pre, you know, our, our pre-interview, you were mentioning some stuff you were concerned about being very controversial. Uh, is there anything you want to uh, tell us about in the next 10 minutes? Well, um, I believe that the, the conclusions that I have come to, that that my mother was murdered uh, as sort of a pre-sacrifice uh, for an anti-Semitic agenda is very controversial. You know, people are 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 very upset about the war in uh, between Israel and Gaza, and uh, in fact, you know, people are alleging. That Israel is committing genocide. Uh, the, the war is not dying down; it's escalating, and it's becoming a war now with Hezbollah. There's also the fact that all this took place at the very time that it is rumored that Iran does indeed have now nuclear capabilities and can uh, fulfill its promise to bomb uh, uh, Israel off the map. Uh, this is has been verified on, on multiple different fronts. So, you know, the, the question is, you know, what happened? I mean, really, what happened on October 7th? How was the fence even breached without the IDF uh, being involved or, yeah. or, or taking action for eight hours? I mean, something is very wrong with the story, just like something has been wrong with other false flag attacks. But we're not getting any any uh, explanation for the breaching of the fence. We're, we're getting resignation. Several uh, uh, IDF you know, officials have resigned over October 7th, but nobody has explained how this happened. But nevertheless, it happened. One thing I find, I'm, I'm not big on uh, false flags, you know, every, you know, like Alex Jones, like everything's a false flag, you know, but clearly some things are. Uh, and I got to tell you something, man, the, the, the video footage we see there of the festival before the attack is just so bizarre. That That's not a normal festival, like a real festival. It's, it, they seem like they're acting, pretending to be at a festival. Have you looked at that? No, no, I haven't. It's, it, and you don't see it. They don't see that video very much anymore. You know, but the, the first day I'm, I'm watching this is what? What is this? <laughs> you know, like uh, anyway. Is there anything else well, you'd like to share with us? We only got about five minutes. Well, you know, I think we're in deep trouble, and uh, I really appreciate your your hosting. You know, my, my presentation today, and and allowing me to speak my mind because. Uh, it does appear to me that that things are not as they appear to be. And uh, and, and one last thing, because you mentioned like the anti-Semitism of the U.S. government, but uh, f- from all appearances, it would appear that the, the U.S. government is fully supporting Israel and, and arming them and, and all kinds of stuff. It... And also, also funneling billions of dollars to Iran. Yeah. Well, no, that was their money, though. That we had we had the, the the international court said we had to return that money. It was their money. Um. International courts. Yeah, no, that, that we that was money that we had seized uh, during the Iranian hostage crisis. We had, uh, uh, and, and, and it was, there was a litigation in the international court. And we had to return that money. Right. Um, there's recently been uh, uh, some publicity to the fact that the U.S. is supporting immunity for Hamas uh, workers who are also involved with UNRWA. So, so they, 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 they're, the U.S. is supporting immunity from prosecution. You know, they, they, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that, that 
seems to uh, indicate a, a deep-seated anti-Semitic agenda. And I'd like to just refer the listening audience to the uh, blockbuster uh, published in the mid-1990s by former DOJ prosecutor John Loftus called The Secret War Against the Jews, in which he rather devastatingly goes through decades of backstabbing by the U.S. Mm. Uh, against the state of Israel. So I think we're, we're living in a time of great deception. Well, like I said, we've got about a minute left. On a personal note, how, how are you feeling uh, you're physically? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm crippled. I can't oh. walk. I, I mean, I'm in, you know, end stage of kidney failure. Yeah. And I wake up every morning, uh, amazingly wake up, and, you know, and glory be, I'm still alive. So I'm continuing to write. Uh, my articles uh, uh, are appearing on Activist Post and elsewhere. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, things could be better. Yeah. yeah. Now, how about, do you have support down there, like people down there helping you? Uh, well, you know, the, 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 the being crippled has produced uh, certain kinds of problems. So I do have someone who will do grocery shopping for gotcha. me. Yeah. So, and you would be okay with me no, asking no, the audience? No, to... Absolutely no medical care. Yeah. You'd be okay with me asking the audience to pray for you? Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm, I would I'm, ask the audience to please great. pray for Para Fallon, uh, uh, Janet Fallon, who has dedicated her life to fighting the good fight, okay? And we're all getting on in years. We're all tired. We're all sick, I mean, myself included, okay? And then in our time of uh, need, we need some support. Now, what about, uh, do you have uh, like a GoFundMe or a, a Patreon? Oh, absolutely, with... absolutely not. I'm not asking for any money. You know, and I'm not asking for any money from the lawsuit. I'm mm. just saying, stop this. You know, this is what you're doing. This is the proof that you're doing it. Stop it. So. Then you we'll can see. support uh, Janet Phelan by going to activist posts and reading her articles and sending her words of encouragement. You can buy the book Exile at bookpatch.com and the other book you can buy on Amazon, uh, which is called... Uh, Real quick here. At the breaking point of history. At the breaking yeah. point of history, how decades of U.S. duplicity enabled a pandemic. Can you go back to, we have that exact title uh, from one of our, I think the first interview I did with Janet Phelan, although I've heard about her for many, many years. I've known about this woman for about, back in, since 1990s. <laughs> to, uh, to reveal our both of our ages here. Janet Fallon, we love you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Keep us updated on what's going on here. And uh, if you ever need a platform, you got me uh, backing you up here, okay? Thank you very much, Ed. Take care. Thank you. Good night.